This meeting is being recorded. Hi, everybody. Good evening. Um, welcome. Thank you for being here. My name is Marcella Duarte. I'm the chair of the Northwest CPC. Um, we have put the agenda for tonight's meeting um, in the chat. You can go to the link or you can just look at the actual agenda. Um, the executive committee here is Karen Schwartz, Jackie Cook, Dr. Stephanie Mack, Jeff Miller, and Tom Forst. So thank you all for being here. Um, first on the agenda is, let's call this meeting to order and introduction of council. Um, has anyone had a chance to review the April minutes? Yep. Can I get a motion to approve the April minutes? I'll move to accept the April minutes. Thank you. Can I get a second? Jackie? Okay, so Karen, thank you. And Jackie with the second. So now we are going to move on to, um, so Commander Mark Landavazo, and excuse me for butchering your name if I did. Um, is going to give an update on the IMR 15, the independent monitors report, um, and how the city scored in this 15th go around, um, and what comes next and all of that great important information. Um, Commander, do you want to take it away? And welcome. Yes, thank you for the introduction. Thank you. Um, I've heard much worse of my name, so believe me, that was pretty good. Um, so thank you for all for having me. I apologize. Uh, my work laptop decided not to work this evening, so it's probably better you don't get to see my face. Um, but regardless, we're here to talk about IMR uh, 15, which was just released. And I was also asked to speak about IMR 14, which was released uh, uh, last, obviously. Uh, apparently that wasn't presented to you folks. So I'd like to present you with some information regarding that and then go into IMR 15 as well. Uh, do I have share screen, screen access, sir? One second. Yeah, I'm. I can um, do that right now. Let's see. Ask to okay, start. Thank you. Okay, should be okay. done. Okay, cool. Thank you, Kelly. Um, I'm not. Oh, there it is. I apologize. Hopefully we can all see the PowerPoint presentation now. Yes, sir. Great, thank you. Okay. So again, we'll be speaking about IMR 14 and 15. Um, my name is Mark Lundavazo. I'm a Lieutenant, currently Acting Commander of the Internal Affairs Professional Standards Office. Uh, and I am also a paragraph lead uh, for the par all paragraphs related to OBRD or the on-body recording devices. Uh, for these presentations, they've tasked different leads with, uh, with presenting information to you folks, uh, to all the different CPCs across town. So I am not uh, necessarily a subject matter expert, but I will certainly do my best to answer any questions you folks may have. And I will definitely take notes and get answers for you if I can't answer any questions. So at the end, please feel free, or while we go through this, please ask any questions as, you see, as you'd like. Um, so again, we're gonna go over um, a brief overview of the, the IMT and the, the monitors and what, what they do. Um, of course, our independent monitor is uh, Dr. James Ginger. He is the head monitor. He has a team um, that he's compiled. Uh, I believe there's eight of them now, uh, folks that uh, that are tasked with monitoring progress at the Alpha Police Department. Basically, these, these leads or these uh, team members, they are tasked with different sections of the CASA, and they work with the paragraph leads here at APD to uh, verify if how we're track this and we're going into compliance and also provide technical assistance. So those are the leads that, uh, or excuse me, the, the uh, team members of the monitoring team. I did put the links in the chat. Uh, the first link is uh, basically has all documents related to the settlement agreement uh, in relation to the Alfred Police Department. It's a great page with a lot of information on there. And specifically, I, there's also links for the 14th monitoring report that was released in November, 2021. And the 15th monitoring report, which was released uh, about a week ago today, actually. So those are in the chat. Um, they are lengthy documents. They contain a lot of information. Um, and they're all structured the same way, each, each independent monitoring report. 
They are structured so that they, they're by section, and we'll go by those sections here next. And then they go in depth into how we can best address those issues, and they also give recommendations. And I apologize if this is a little elementary. I just want to make sure everyone has a, a good overview and uh, can move forward. So the different sections uh, the, the cost is broken down to are specifically use of force, specialized units, crisis intervention, policies and training, uh, misconduct, complaint intake and investigations, uh, staffing and supervision, recruitment, officer assistance and support, and community engagement. Each of these different sections typically has a different lead that's tasked from APD to, uh, to try to meet the obligations of the, of the CASA and try to gain uh, ultimately operational compliance. The CASA itself contains 344 paragraphs, which all contain recommendations or are given a status level. And if they're not operational, many of them have recommendations on how we can reach, reach operational compliance. So there's quite a, quite a bit of data there, quite a bit of things to cover. 276 of those paragraphs actually have measurable compliance levels. And we have three different compliance levels that we're trying to meet. Um, primary compliance means that we have policies and procedures in place, meaning that we can uh, move forward um, into, this is the baseline, right? We start, if you, if, it will, if you will, it's a pyramid. The very bottom of that pyramid is the primary compliance. It's uh, establishing policies and procedures to guide us forward. Secondary compliance builds upon the first, and it's training, getting officers trained, getting uh, staff trained uh, to be able to accomplish those policies and procedures as outlined in the first level of compliance. And then finally, we have operational compliance. It's defined as daily operations, meaning that APDs meeting these goals daily on their own with no oversight, and it's monitored by the monitoring team. So those are the levels of compliance. This is a graph of our uh, progressive graph over the different IMRs, all the way back to IMR1, of the levels of our compliance levels or how, how well we're meeting the different levels. As you can see, we've met primary compliance since IMR 8, uh, which was many years ago now. Uh, every, every single uh, measurable paragraph had uh, uh, primary compliance, meaning that policies and, and, and procedures were in place. Sec secondary compliance is the next big threshold, again, meaning that we're, uh, that we're being to train on, the, on these things, right? So if you'll notice, we are very proud and very happy to announce of our huge progress in IMR 15. 99% uh, secondary compliance. That is huge. Uh, by far the highest level the department's ever been at, and it's a, it's a good thing moving forward. So we've now reached secondary compliance, 99% of the paragraphs as of IMR 15. Operational uh, compliance. Director, yes, can I ask a quick question? That's incredible. Um, how did you guys reach 99%? Um, That's amazing. Can Like, what changed? It is. Uh, it's something we're... Yeah, that's yeah, incredible. We're very excited about. So it's, it's really a combination of a lot of things and a lot of hard work by a lot of folks. Our compliance bureau who pulls the lion's share of the weight on these tasks, um, they're tasked with uh, putting a plan in place to, to how are we gonna meet these goals. They have really, in really the past year, a uh, year and a half or so, put pathways in place, if you will, to, to make it easier for us to, to, how are we gonna meet compliance? And these pathways put in place uh, by the Compliance Bureau have made it significantly easier to understand what we're trying to accomplish. Um, so I credit much, much of that to the Compliance Bureau led by uh, Deputy Chief Lowe, uh, Corey Lowe, and, and her team. Um, also her, it's been around for, for, for a few years now, but the, uh, the auditors and such were auditing our own data. Uh, something that hasn't happened at EPD and it's, it's probably long overdue. So it's, it's a lot of work, a lot of hard work by a lot of people, and a lot of focus to say, hey, we're going to bear down, we're going to deal with this, and we're going to uh, to approach it the right way. And uh, it, it really is great. So um, hopefully that answered your question. It did. Um, so 99% secondary compliance. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Um, and then in uh, the last phase of compliance, we're 70% of, as of IMR 15. That means that we're doing it uh, every day without oversight. We're accomplishing our, our goals. Um, but again, that's a number we haven't reached in the past, and we're very happy to say that's the highest level it's ever been at. So we're, we're certainly moving in the right direction as a department, and we're excited to spread this information to you folks. Uh, so again, we're going to talk about IMR 14 briefly, um, because it wasn't presented to you folks in the past, and back in November when it was released. Primary compliance, like I said, since IMR 8, we've been at 100%. Secondary compliance is at 82%, which was growth over the previous period, and 62% operational compliance. Um, that was a big jump from uh, that, that operational compliance has always kind of teetered around 60 and the 60% range for the past several years now or past year and a half. 
Um, it's just a matter of getting things right. Uh, oftentimes, what, what the monitors like to say is that it's, it's much easier to gain operational compliance than to stay in operational compliance because it means we have to actually grade ourselves, make sure we have policies in place, make sure we're holding people accountable, and make sure we're all doing our job correctly to maintain operational compliance. So that's why that number jumps around quite a bit. Um, in IMR 14, it was 62%, and as we saw in IMR 15, we jumped to 70. So um, we'll delve a little into IMR 14. Uh, this is part one of IMR 14. Again, it's, if you remember, we have the different groups we look at. Um, so specifically, again, use of force. In IMR 14, we saw a total number of paragraphs with increased compliance at six. Um, so six paragraphs went up within that within that suite. And total number of uh, paragraphs with no change at all was 69, and one one paragraph went down. It's important to note that these things can fluctuate back and forth just as as trends happen within the department, uh, policy changes. Maybe it has they have unintended consequences. There's a lot of moving parts in there, so we don't get too alarmed with with minor changes of one or two. Uh, but when we see big changes like six moving forward into a, in a positive way, that's a sign the department's doing something in, in, in the right way. So I don't want to bore you with reading each of these to you. But as you can see, certain areas, specialized units, that's uh, specifically like our SWAT unit, has been 100% uh, compliance for, for many years. Uh, policies and training has, has been uh, in state, state stagnant this, this last period, or it's probably MR14. Again, this was released in November. Um, this is the next set of, uh, of sections of the CASA. Uh, tracking their change. Again, a lot of uh, stagnation, um, but mostly improvement uh, is what we're looking for, right? Is the improvement versus the, the decreased compliance. Um, the misconduct, complaint intake, and investigations and education took a bit of a hit this during IMR 14, but during IMR 15, it increased. And that was due to policy changes and uh, basically just following the recommendations of our monitors to, to move in the right direction. This is a lot of in information that I just and really, it's a, it's a really quick summary, quick quick way to look at how things have changed, but really without getting into the IMR and actually reading it and, and seeing what, what what the trends are, that's where you really get a lot of information. And that's certainly about outside the scope of this meeting. That's a, that would be a, an all-day task. And then finally, the last two from IMR 14. Again, a lot of stagnation, which we're okay with. We're, we're okay with things kind of staying the same and being where they're at. Um, nothing too alarming in these numbers. Nothing, no huge changes, but a lot of things staying the same way, which we're which is a goal also to to move up, but also not move down. So MR15, again, these numbers we're very happy about. Um, primary compliance still at 100%, secondary at 99, up from the 70s, and operationals from the mid-60s up to 70%. Um, an increase of 20.7% in secondary compliance and 12.9% in operational. Just huge numbers, um, unheard of within the Upper Police Department in our time of being in a, in a consent decree, and uh, really just move in the right direction. So very similar to the set from IMR 14, these are the changes in 15. Um, you'll notice those top numbers, a, a, a lot of big numbers. Use of force, that, that's a huge one. Um, our Internal Affairs Force Division has been working hard to working with EFIT, um, the Enhanced Force Investigations Team, um, which I'll speak about briefly here in a bit. Uh, working with those folks to try to get our compliance numbers up in, in force, and that's been a, a positive, positive move, obviously, there. Um, going to the next part, next group of... Uh, of paragraphs, again, like I spoke about the internal affairs and misconduct investigations moving up a tad, and then huge movements in supervision uh, with those 18 uh, paragraphs moving in a positive direction and then moving down. Uh, again, a lot of that, there's been a lot of policy change in the past year uh, regarding supervision. If anyone has any questions, I'll be more than happy to, to answer. But we did change our, 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 super, our, our discipline policy uh, this last year and we saw a lot of positive effect from that. And what's great about that is the other thing I could tout about the, the, the policy change reference discipline is it was not only helped our compliance efforts, but also seemed to help somewhat with morale. I don't want to say it's, it's the, the huge fix, but it's a, it's a step in the right direction towards getting officers on board to see why we're doing what we're doing um, and breaking things down a little bit to favor the officers. Not to say we're not having them, holding them accountable, but uh, a policy that's a little more uh, digestible, if you will, for an officer. And then finally, part three, um, again, some, a lot of increased compliance, community engagement and oversight, they saw quite the jump. And um, yeah, so I'm R14, or 15, a lot of big jumps. Um, so I did have a few key points I also wanted to bring up. Um, we saw a huge increase um, in the OBRD paragraphs, and that's, I have, I'm intimately, intimately aware of those paragraphs. Paragraphs, if anyone has any questions reference to the on-body recording devices, 
we went from, I believe it was seven paragraphs in secondary compliance, and now we only have two in secondary. The rest are all operational. Um, and again, I wanted to speak about EFITS, the Enhanced Force Investigation Team. That's the folks that uh, the city contracted with to, to be experts, if you will, that follow around our force detectives to assist them with investigations, answer any questions they have, as well as reviewing any, any investigations they conduct. That program has proven to be uh, valuable. And they also, uh, an unintended consequence, if you will, of, of the EFIT program has been that they are noticing a lot of things that APD has said that it wasn't working policy-wise. They're sort of validating those points, and they're an outside party. They don't have they don't have a horse in the game. They don't have a, you know, of course they want to see it succeed, but um, they're outside. They're an outside entity, and we're able to use that validation to to say that where we need positive policy change to not only help the officers out in the field, but also help uh, with our compliance efforts. That was a very quick overview of IMR 14 and 15. I hope it wasn't too quick for you. I'll stand for any questions. Any answers I do not have for you, I will certainly uh, jot down and get back to you. Um, yeah, so I'll take any questions if you folks have them. Thank you so much, Commander. Um, I We do have a question from one of our members, Tom Force. What does IMR 1 through 15 stand for? Why is IMR 1 so low? Great question. I'll go and scroll back so we can look at that slide. So IMR 1 was the very first, and I apologize, I should have really broken it down more. An IMR is an independent, independent monitoring report. So they number each of their monitoring reports. Um, they go in six month periods, um, the three month periods, I apologize, three month periods. And they, it's the, the measuring time, snapshot of time of that period where the monitoring team will grade us on our compliance. So IMR one was the very first uh, monitoring report. Obviously we had little time to, uh, to affect change within those short few months. So as expected, numbers are quite low. Um, and as you can see, it progresses over time. So really there was no time to make any change. Um, we moved, uh, but we quickly by IMR four within a year, we moved up to, to, to significant change. Obviously developing policy takes time, has to be improved by a lot of folks per the CASA. The policy that can't change overnight, it's, it's not the way it's gonna happen. And it's, it's probably the way it should be. So, you know, to see those policies change within a year is about what we expected. And um, hopefully that answers that question. Yes. Okay. And thank you so much. Okay. So the next question we have is from Gail Stevens. And what do we have to do to bring up operational compliance? Yes. Yeah, so operational compliance means that we as a department are doing these things every day on our own without oversight. And it's, it's happening every day. Um, as you can see on this chart, there's a very slow upward trend. IMR 13 we took a notable hit, and that's been discussed uh, pretty thoroughly throughout our department. Um, but we have been on the increase since, so we're happy with that. So to be operational, we have to have the policies in place. We have to have the training completed. And then the, the most difficult part of this process is proving how we're doing it. So we've been working hard as a department, and especially the Compliance Bureau, of, of proving the efforts we've made. So it's one thing to say that you know we have a use of force suite that's 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 been trained, the officers all know what to do, um, but how do we prove that these things are being done and they're, they're effective, right? And that's, that's a difficult question, it's a, it's a huge lift. So we've gone a lot more into data mining and providing data to the monitors in, in, the, in the past two years. And that's really how we prove that we're moving in the right direction. We can show the trends are towards the department holding officers accountable and, and being fair and consistent in our discipline um, or that you know these policies are being are not being violated anymore when they used to be. So it's really just proving that it's happening, and that, that's, that's a difficult thing to capture. And as a police department, um, admittedly, we probably didn't do the best job of that in the past. So we actually brought on a new data director um, just recently. I think he started a month ago. Um, he comes from uh, Nashville PD, uh, a civilian, uh, and he has a PhD. I forget what it's in. I apologize. Uh, but we're making those kind of steps to, to move in the right direction, and we expect our numbers to go up from there. So it's really proving that we're doing what we're doing, and that's how we can get operational compliance up. Thank you. Uh, so the next question is, and I feel like I hear this question quite a bit, what will <laughs> it take to get out of CASA monitoring? Seems like a drain on resources. You know, it. Yes, it, it can be. You know, there's a lot of uh, a lot of people going towards this effort to prove what we're doing. 
the good thing is, is once a lot of these systems in place, we can, at the chief's discretion, obviously, we can look at allocating those resources to other places once the processes are in place. Um, that that's the uh, the kind of feel good answer that we can sort of make that happen once everything, all the processes in place. Um, but yes, it is very manpower intensive. Um, there has been a move recently to civilianize a lot of these positions of of the compliance bureau. Um, that that bureau is made up. The vast majority are civilians. Uh, there are very few sworn personnel over there. Um, because, you know, me being a me being a cop, what makes me a data expert, obviously, very few qualifications to do that. Right. So bringing in a doctor of with, with these type of things who has a doctorate in, in, in statistics and such, he's going to have a lot more input and push us in the right direction. So to get to get out of cost of monitoring is going to mean that we're going to have to be operational to a certain level. Um, and then once the judge agrees that we we met that obligation, um, then we go into sort of a probation period where we're still monitored, but not as close as we are now. And then once that that's typically anywhere from a year to two years, once that process is complete, and then we'll be out of the consent decree. Um, and that's everyone's goal is to move forward, make our department better, and uh, be able to take care of ourselves. Yeah, thank you. Um, has increased compliance with the CASA had an effect on officer morale? And if so, are there plans to address improving their perspective? This is from our very own Karen. That is a fantastic question. Thank you for that. Um, you know, the increased compliance with the CASA, this was released a week ago. So, you know, it's, it's, this is brand new information you folks are receiving. It um, obviously there's that trickle down effect. It's going to take a while to, to, to sort of to see a positive impact. Now, are your street officers out there necessarily concerned with, we, hey, we went from 82 to 99 percent? Um, honest, honest answer, probably not, right? They're the ones out there doing the work. Um, being the face of our department and the backbone of our department. But the idea, the hope is that it sort of trickles down, the, 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 the training's improved, the, uh, the policies are skewing the right way or, or to, to hopefully make things better for the officers and hopefully give them their, that positive outlook. Um, of course, those things will take time to kind of trickle that way, but it's, it's, but it's a very positive thing. Yeah, and I think any officer in the department will say, you know, any move towards compliance is a good thing. Um, does it directly improve morale? Uh, the short answer is no. Hopefully over time, though, it will with the better policies, better training, and just the um, the, the sort of accomplishment, if you will, of, uh, of being closer to this goal of, of meeting compliance. Okay, thanks for that question, Karen. And finally, uh, Commander, what are some of the biz biggest successes between IMR 14 and IMR 15? And that's from Janet. You know, we've seen... Thank you, Janice. That's a great question. Also, um, we've seen a lot of huge advancement um, in our force division in this past IMR and IMR 15. Um, their numbers have, have gone up dramatically, um, attributed probably to a few things. The, the EFIT, as I mentioned, they had a big policy overhaul within the past year, year and a half. And that training was last year um, that all officers received. Um, so we've seen some improvement in the force, I, internal affairs force division side of things and their force investigations. Um, so that, that's been a big positive move move to, to hopefully make things better. Um, another huge advancement in IMR 15 that saw one of the biggest changes was our academy. Um, again, it's probably going to be due to, to some new folks we brought on board. Um, we have a new director of, uh, of training at the academy, uh, Commander Renee McDermott, who's retired from the from the FBI and worked at their, their, uh, their academy out in Quantico. Um, certainly a huge pickup because you know, they're, they're one of the gold standards of training. So, um, and the people over the academy have just been working hard and improving their processes and, and, and methods in place to provide the, some of the best training for our officers. So those, those two, I would tout as being the, the highest or the most increase uh, between the, the most, the, the two last IMRs. So, and actually we have a follow-up question from Karen and you said we need to achieve a certain level of operational compliance. Does it need to be 100% or do we know? And I was actually going to ask that same question. So thank you, Karen. Very observant. You saw me uh, trying not to answer that specifically. Yeah. I don't know. The answer. <laughs> so, um, okay. But I'll certainly, I'll, I'll find that out tomorrow and I can email it to you folks and then you can distribute it to, to your council. Um, but I'm I will follow up and that week tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I was trying to skirt that answer. Um, but yes, I will find it for you. Oh, 95% from Elizabeth Martinez. Thank you, Ms. Martinez. 95% is what, we're, what we have to achieve. Thank you. 
Thank you. Um, this is such great information and you guys have, the numbers from IMR 15 are, I think, exceptional. Um, are there any other questions from anybody? If I can make a quick question and a comment, uh, we at the CPC have roughly 1% of the IMR report. We're very small fish in a big ocean, but we got 100% compliance for the second reporting period in a row. So we can take a little bit of pride in that. And uh, also, sir, um, I was just wondering, what are the what is the best outcome and the worst outcome? You've talked about the best outcome, which is coming out of the uh, IMR uh, system, but let's just say that things go downhill again, and then when we and we go through a couple of bad stages, we talk, we hear about going into receivership. What does that mean? Just say for the city of Albuquerque. It's a great question. Um, we. First of all, we're cognizant there are going to there will be a bit of a roller coaster, right? Um, we saw a huge jump this past IMR 15. I certainly hope that continues, um, but we're also cognizant of something changed, you know, five months ago that's going to affect us for IMR 16. Um, so we're cognizant of that. Receivership, that's not a question I'm prepared to answer. I don't want to give any wrong, wrong information, um, and it's, um, it's a very legal answer that I don't want to uh, provide incorrectly. So I'll, I'll do my homework and make sure I provide that for you if that's okay. 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 Also, we need to get, we need to reach, reach the 100 and 195 levels, two reports in a row. Is that correct? I believe. I'm sorry. Can you repeat the question? Uh, we, we need to reach the, uh, the standards of 100, 195, two reports in a row in order to be out of, out of the IMR process. Is that correct? That's my understanding, but I guess I, I should probably follow up before I give it a, a affirmative answer. Okay, thank you, sir. Of course, I'll get this to you. Um, this is, okay, we had one more question from Dennis. Oh, it says he's, this is more of a comment. Is this info getting out to the public? APD needs all the good PR it can get, and this is good stuff. I agree. This is this is really good stuff. This is very informational. Um, so that's more of a comment. Are there any final questions, concerns, suggestions? Any last comments from Commander? Mm, yes. No. Okay, well, thank you so much for being here. We appreciate your time and information. Um, and I think we'll move on to next item on the agenda. And that is Lieutenant Nick, is Nick, Kelly, is Nick here? Lieutenant Nick Wheeler here? Hello, I am Patterson. I'm stepping in for Lieutenant Wheeler. Oh, okay, cool, thank you. So we have Lieutenant Chris Patterson, who is going to um, give the detailed traffic report, right? Is that correct, sir? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, just to introduce myself, my name is Chris Patterson. I'm the lieutenant for the DWI section. I'm also a swing shift motors here for the city of Albuquerque. Um, I've been in this position since September of uh, last year, so still kind of uh, new into the unit. Um, it was a good time for us. We actually, not everyone's aware of it, but we actually started a swing shift motor unit. So we have one sergeant and four officers that are assigned to a citywide motor unit. They come in at four o'clock in the afternoon and work until about two o'clock in the morning to help deal with some of the um, problem issues that come up with traffic enforcement, uh, namely the street racers and some of the off hour traffic issues that come up uh, across the city. Um, so, we have those officers, they are motors officers, so they're on motorcycles every day, rain, sleet, snow, shine, they're out there, uh, myself included. So um, that's gonna, that was a big bump that we brought uh, forward for the traffic. Um, that's been a big push for the administration recently with some of the issues going on last year with the high number of fatalities that we had last year, um, 85 total fatalities, and I believe there were about 46 or 48 uh, serious injury callouts as, as well. Um, a serious injury callout is something where the person may not, um, obviously they haven't died, 
but the injuries were so severe that they were life altering for that individual. Um, so our, our goal is to help reduce that. The department took a shift in how the motor officers were being utilized. Um, traditionally, they would be, would be out responding to traffic crashes. You would see them show up to take the crash report and then in their off time, they would be out writing citations. Uh, we're taking a different approach. Um, instead, we're focusing more on enforcement of traffic violations instead of responding to crashes. Uh, we have some extra PSAs or police service aides who've been assigned to the motor unit to help the field in dealing with those crashes because, again, I understand you know having to wait um, for a long period of time to have an officer come out for your crash. Um, you know that's that's not ideal either. But our goal is to help try and reduce some of those crashes. Um, I'll talk about some of the numbers here in just a second, but we have seen a pretty significant reduction in the number of fatalities and serious injury callouts that we've had over this year. Um, this time last year, we were at 26 fatalities. Um, and this year so far, we're at 21, which doesn't sound as great, but that's five more individuals who hadn't, who hadn't died this year that died last year. Um, in addition, there's a, a, also a significant decrease in our number of serious fatalities or serious injury callouts as well. Um, Department-wide, last year, the, um, the entire department issued uh, 15,395 total citations. Um, this year to date, the department has kicked out over 24,708 citations as of this morning when we pulled these numbers. So we've almost doubled the number of citations in this period of time alone. Um, DWI arrests for last year, we had 435 for the whole department. Um, this year we're up to 537. And the racing, which is a big topic, I know we've all seen on the news. Um, last year, nine citations were issued for street racing. And this year, the department has issued 26. Um, modified exhaust, I know, is another concern, especially in every neighborhood in the city, um, having those drivers going through with, with those. We had 88 citations that were issued last year. This year, we've issued 120 citations. So we're increasing those numbers with, with those enforcement. This year, um, well, with our traffic division, specifically dealing with what we deal with, last year, the traffic division out of that 15,000 citations, the traffic division issued 6,941. So about half of those citations came from the traffic division. This year so far, we've issued 14,533. So our division, which, which encompasses 30 motor officers and seven DWI officers, have issued 14,533 citations out of the whole 24,708 that the department has issued as a whole. So you can see where our time has been spent in not addressing with those crashes, but trying to help with the enforcement. Um, we've made 200 and we, well, in 2001, we made 265 arrests from our, my DWI unit. This year alone, we've made 343 DWI arrests and then an additional 10 BRE, which are the impaired drivers who are impaired or intoxicated on drugs or other illegal substances not to be um, classified as alcohol. We've issued, last year, we issued nine racing citations. This year, we've issued 29. Um, the other thing that we've also changed is the city council passed a spectating uh, statute for street racing, which is a big tool that allows us to cite individuals who are um, participating by watching these illegal straight races. Um, we've been issuing those citations now, and my last count as of today, uh, we had issued 83 citations for spectating an illegal street race. So dealing with those drivers and the group of people that are showing up to help encourage these drivers to, you know, conduct these illegal activities. Um, last year, we issued 41 modified exhaust citations, and this year, we've issued 65. Um, so again, we're seeing improvement in all those numbers around and, you know, we're, we're only halfway through, not even halfway through the year at this point, and we're going to continue to keep pushing forward. Um, I'll speak on a couple things that my uh, swing shift unit does. Again, they are uh, four officers and one sergeant. Um, we're looking at having another team added on, hopefully at the end of the summer, which would give us week-long coverage in those off hours. Um, currently, the team that works right now works Wednesday through 
Saturday, coming in at four o'clock in the afternoon, going home at two. The new team that would come on hopefully at the end of the summer would work Sunday through Wednesday, again, coming on at four o'clock in the afternoon, getting off at two o'clock in the morning. So we'd be able to address some of the concerns that come from your neighborhoods, um, especially those off hour incidents or the street racing, um, the aggressive drivers, we'd be able to have a team that we could move around the city to cover those issues any day of the week. And that's that's my goal and Commander Veer's goal as well to, to get those forward. Um, and obviously, as everybody knows, you know, there is a shortage of officers. Um, that's a problem we're, we're well aware of, but we're working to try and overcome that. Um, we have a lot of grant funding that we use to pay the officers overtime that comes from the state that doesn't come from the city. Um, that's state funding that we use to help supplement and have officers out there more often looking for those impaired drivers, the DWI um, drivers, and to use for some of the operations like the street racing um, that go on across the city. Um, I know we do have some areas here in the Northwest. I live in the Northwest, so I, I feel your pain. Um, I'm out there. In fact, when I'm done with the meeting here tonight, I'll be out there. So hopefully I don't see any of you um, over in the uh, um, Unser, Bandelier, um, McMahon area. So watch your speed, a little warning for you right there. Uh, but we're out there every night looking to see if we can make the road safer for everybody out there. Um, I noticed there was a couple questions. Let me respond to some of those here real quick. So the first question is, is um, how is the Northwest doing? Where is our biggest problem area? So the Northwest, it's, it's doing pretty well, actually. Some of the bigger areas that we have problems with are on Coors um, and Unser. Um, just because those are the kind of the main thoroughfares that unfortunately the Northwest has those, um, you know, north south running streets, they get clogged up. Um, I don't know of anyone who drives on Coors and does the 45 everybody's going 60 or 65. Um, I have two officers that love to sit out there on Coors you've probably seen them um, around the um, Montano and La Rilla area running radar out there. Um, Unser another area that we kind of focus on. Uh, we see some areas there. Uh, we try to deal with the school zones that we have. Um, the one there at Rainbow um, and Woodmont um, for Volcano Vista, uh, Tony Hillerman and Tierra Antigua for the students that are coming there in the mornings. Uh, we've had a continued issue there. We're having enforcement and a presence there at least twice a week um, trying to deal with that speeding in that area. Um, so those are kind of the big areas that we've seen a lot of uh, the main speeding. We do have some issues in some of the neighborhoods um, as well that kind of spring off of Irving, um, off of Ellison um, and McMahon, um, especially McMahon kind of coming down the hill, if you were from Cayenta, or if you're going um, traveling west from golf course, um, that area also is very notorious for speeders. Um, and we're, we're out there as well, trying to help slow drivers down. Uh, that's a great question. And actually, um, I, there's a question from Janice. And she said, um, or no, Jackie, excuse me, Jackie, do you want to ask your question? Oh, you're muted. Okay, so I, I see the comment about uh, officers not having discretion in accidents involving red light running and not issuing citations. Right. Okay, so with that, that's red light running is kind of hard because um, the violation has to be seen by the officer. So the odds are we're not there to see the accident when it occurs. So what happens is we have one driver that says, oh, I had a green light. And inevitably the other driver is gonna say they had the green light. So if we have other witnesses that are there that can confirm that one driver had it or not, those officers should be issuing the citation. Uh, we do have some camera footage, as you guys have seen on some of the intersections that have the RTC cameras. Uh, we do routinely check those to see if those come up and if they were able to capture the footage of the accident. It may not be something that the citation is issued right there on the spot because if they're having to wait to get that camera footage, but if it's found out, then we do issue a summons, which is they're then charged later and have to appear in court for that red light violation. Uh, I was told by an officer, no that a person admitted on his body cam that she had run the red light. No citation was issued. Okay. 
Can I, I take that up with the commander of that? I, I would, yes. If it was, if they freely admitted that they ran the red light, then yes, the citation should have been issued um, by that, that officer out there. I don't know why they didn't. Um, obviously, that's a contributing factor to the crash. Um, you know, that's something that caused the crash and it's something that the officer should have addressed by issuing that citation. But in general, if the, well, I guess the officer's not usually there. So that explains. Yes. I have friends who have repeated, oh yeah, no citation. Yeah, in, in general, and, I, and I've, I've been in that position myself, ma'am. Um, you know, I've, I've been on the department for 16 years. Um, I spent 10 years in the field. Um, and have responded to several crashes where I've had one driver saying, yes, they, they had the green light, the other one saying that they had. And unfortunately, most of the people who were there when the crash occurred, they kept on driving. So I don't have a witness there who can confirm whether or not that driver had the red light or not. So that's what happens sometimes um, with those red light violations. Um, I can tell you, and I know all of you have seen it, um, you know, you're sitting at that red light, especially uh, Coors Montano, you know, that they get that uh, red arrow and then three or four more cars pass through. Um, you know, that's something we're working to, to curtail. Um, we're doing a focus on that. We actually had a, um, a traffic operation that we did in the Northwest last month in the area of Coors and Quail, where we were trying to address some of those red light running on the turn arrows. Um, I, unfortunately, I don't have the, the numbers from that, but we were out there for a good three hours trying to issue citations and stop some of that driving Again, Great. those operations move throughout the city. We can't focus in one area command. We hop around um, just like we do the freeway operations. I'm sure some of you all saw the news. We were out there on I-25 southbound last week um, issuing citations for speeding and had 178 citations issued in two and a half hours. Yes, yeah, the motor officers were speaking at the Citizens Police Academy uh, the day after that happened. They were very proud of those numbers. <laughs> yes, we were very proud. It was. It was a, it was good in, in the amount of enforcement that we did, but it was also sad to see just how many people were speeding in coming into the city, and you know, hopefully we change some behavior at least for a little bit uh, until we end up doing it again on another part of the freeway. Great, thank you for answering my question. Of course, ma'am. Thanks, Jackie. Um, there is a question: um, Does APT still use sobriety checkpoints? Yes, so we do. Um, that's actually one of my main jobs is running the checkpoints that we have. Um, last year, we ran 23 different sobriety checkpoints throughout the city. Um, this year, I have another 23 scheduled um, for the next year. Um, they do rotate between the area commands, um, except for when we have state fair, because that's directed around the state fair. Um, we rotate every area command um, in different locations based off of crash data that we get, um, arrest data for uh, drunk drivers. Um, and then we actually pull information from the University of New Mexico. They collect all the crash reports that come in across the state and they uh, develop hotspots uh, basically that show where we more likely to see um, impaired driving, impaired driving offenses and crashes at a specific date or time. So we use that data to then go and then set up a checkpoint in that area. Um, normally they start at about uh, 11 o'clock at night and we'll go until about two, three o'clock in the morning um, and we'll have those out. When I first started, uh, the news was actually posting the results of our checkpoints. They did that for a couple times. I saw those on the news and then for whatever reason, channel four and channel 13 stopped posting those. I don't know why I keep sending them out, but we are out there. Uh, we had one. Um, the last one that we did was actually on uh, May 5th. Um, we're out in the Northeast Area Command, and we have another one scheduled for later this month uh, that will be in your all's neck of the woods, but unfortunately, I can't say when and where, but we'll be out there helping to help keep the road safe for you all. Thank you. Um, and there's a thanks so much for making a difference in this major problem, and it is. And I actually have a question. What would you say is the most common um, infraction like would you say it's speeding like just general speeding or would you say drag racing or would you say like in your what would you say i i would say the in general the the biggest violation that we see is going to be speeding and cell phone use um everybody's using their cell phone it, either they're talking texting 
or using whatever sort of navigation or different apps at the same time. That's it's illegal by state statute. It's illegal by city ordinance. Um, everybody's everybody's doing it. Even the simple act of going and touching your phone to accept a call to have it transfer over onto your Bluetooth. That's enough by state statute to be cited for using your cell phone it has to be completely hands free. Um, speeding is a constant one. Red lights are a constant one. Um, the drag racing, um, modified exhaust, those are kind of more tailor specific to certain times of day in certain areas. Um, but they're, you know, they're prolific during those time periods. But for the most part, I'd say your general are going to be your speeding, your cell phone, and your red lights. Thank you. Um, this is from Steve. Would like to know about petitioning for double fine zones on roads with where with racing occurring day and night. Is this possible? How can we submit a petition? Does that question make sense to you? Yes, it does. So um, it would be possible. Um, it would something would have to be something that the city council um, you would have to submit you know, bring that to your counselor's attention. And then they would have to go through the, the process there to enact a law or a, uh, an enhancement to the speeding law, which would then apply and, and identify what streets or what times of day that these racing areas would occur. Um, and then that would have to get passed into city ordinance. And then that would then be another tool we, we could use. Um, it's not a quick fix. It's something that would have to go through the entire process. And I'm sure you know, I don't want to speak for all the city councilors, but um, I'm sure there's several areas in each council district that they would want to have identified and, you know, have those issues brought up um, and that would have to go through city council. Um, I think it'd be, you know, it would definitely would be a deterrent, just like we see for the construction zones where you have the double fines and school zones where you see the double fines, um, you know, that's obviously it's a good deterrent to have. Thank you. Um, this one's from Tara and are the speed cameras up yet? If so, how is that coming along? Is this, is that enforced by APD or is it like Rio Rancho speed bands? Do so, people have to go to court for those violations? Okay, I will do my best to answer some of those questions. So Lieutenant Wheeler is the one who's in charge of the automated speed enforcement. Um, from my understanding, Right now, there are three cameras that are up and running. Um, two of them are fixed systems on Gibson, and there's one portable system that's up and running on Montgomery. They were kind of our pilot cameras. Uh, we are live right now with a warning period, um, which started April 25th and will go until May 25th, where live citations will be issued to drivers um, who are in violation of the speed. Now, they are set um, to get more cameras um, in fixed and uh, mobile positions. I don't know where those cameras are gonna be placed. Some of them are still being kind of hammered out, but they'll be spread out across the city with the fixed cameras and then the mobile cameras allow us, similar to the Rio Rancho speed bands, um, allow us to move those around to different areas. Um, the only issue that we have is they cannot be placed on state road. So um, Coors, Paseo del Norte, um, in your area command, um, unfortunately the state does not allow us to place those uh, those devices on, on state funded roads. Um, as far as the citations, it's a civil fine. So um, I believe it's a hundred dollar flat rate that you would be fined. You'd have the opportunity to either pay the fine, uh, request community service where there's a uh, breakdown of how many hours. Again, I, unfortunately, I don't have that information that you would do of community service in lieu of paying the fine. Um, or you can contest the fine and then we go through an administrative hearing. Now that program is being run through uh, Department of Municipal Development. It's not being run by APD. We do have one officer right now who's currently assigned with another one who's coming who will review the citations basically to make sure that the license plate that the camera collected is the license plate that's on the vehicle would run a license plate check to make sure that that license plate matches the vehicle in the event that someone you know, had a stolen plate, which unfortunately does happen here on occasion. So that way you as the innocent owner aren't issued a citation, you know, for your red Toyota that was on a red Ford and then would have to pay that, that fine. Um, so there's, there would be two officers that would review those citations and then um, 
if they were approved, they would be sent out to, to the individual. Now, there's not a court in sense that you wouldn't go down to Metro Court to contest the fine. It would be an administrative hearing. Um, I don't know the location of where that hearing would occur, but there would be there is a process in place that you would be able to contest um, that citation if you if you felt the need to, and um, then it would be up to an administrative judge to desert determine if you had to pay that fine or if it was going to be uh, lifted. Uh, hopefully that helps answer your question, Tara. I'm sorry I don't have more of the information for you. Thank you. Um, red light running, for, I think this is in regards to red light running. Are personal car cams in resident vehicles admissible for citation and prosecution? Um, so if my understanding in uh, Steve, correct me if I'm if I'm wrong in, in that, but if you had uh, like a GoPro mounted in your vehicle um, and you were in a crash and that captured the fact that you had a green line, that would that would be admissible. Um, the officer would have to collect that video from you um, and then tag that into evidence um, for the chain of custody that we could then use that in court to display the fact that, hey, this is what happened in the crash. Uh, we see that a lot with commercial drivers um, here in across the nation and some motorcyclists will actually have their GoPros on their helmets or on their bike to capture something that happened in front of them. So if you had a device that was capturing it, that would be evidence and that we could use in, in court and in trial, um, we would just have to collect that from you. Thank you. And, and then this is a question from Karen. Have you ever done red light running stings where officers sit there and watch that happen? We can tell you which intersections, which, yeah, it is It is a thing now. I mean, it's like used to be kind of trying to get through it yellow. No, it's red and people are still going. It's, yeah, so that's yeah. Karen's question. It, it, it is, and unfortunately, um, and Karen, I, I, I totally get what you're saying. You could pick any intersection and you're going to have it. Um, I've seen it. I stopped one vehicle today at, at uh, Coors of Montano for doing it. Um, you know, at basically any of your major intersections, you're going to see it. Um, we do not necessarily stings, if you will, but the officers will go out there to various intersections. They'll sit out there for um, an hour or so and work that um, and then move to do either another activity, um, another intersection or deal with another problem. Um, I also have, like I stated, so part of the, the funding that we have with grant funding, um, one of the grants that I'm, I administer is called Buckle Up, which, in for, which focuses on seatbelt usage, but the officer sits at an intersection, and looks for seatbelt seat belt violations. However, while they're there, if there is a red light violation, those officers do enforce those red light violations. They'll go conduct that stop, issue the citation, and it's, it's a benefit in the fact that Obviously, those drivers at that given moment see that red light violation. They see the instant traffic stop that you know follows that, um, and that's good. But every other driver who drives by while seeing that car pulled over on the side of the road, hopefully, gets the hint that, hey, you know, we shouldn't be doing this. Um, so that's that's a grant funding that we run as well. Um, that's that's kind of ongoing throughout the year. Okay. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions for Lieutenant Patterson? This is, oh, Jeff, you have your hand up. Um, and this isn't a question, but this is just a, um, a public awareness. I, I can personally attest to uh, uh, Lieutenant Chris Patterson's team, uh, the traffic and, and the DUI officers. I've, I've, um, know quite a bit about them and I'll leave it at that but I can tell you this I see professionalism at its best and um, you know just people just visualize this a little bit you know like I seen the question on the checkpoint and they run the checkpoints and you know they see everything they see drunk drivers that have kids in the cars they're very compassionate to that child and to the spouse who wasn't driving the vehicle I've seen them get blankets out of their cars when it's cold and, and give them to the people that were riding with the, with the um, impaired drivers. And I've seen his guys just do phenomenal work on a continuous basis while being um, very heavily uh, um, cursed, spit on, 
um, you name it, they see it. And I can say this, I've, I've been in, involved with the DUI unit for uh, eight, going on nine years now. And every one of the uh, teams seemed really good, but this is the tightest I have seen the DUI unit and the traffic unit that supports the DUI unit in my eight years of uh, being around them. So uh, Chris, I, I wanna thank you. I know what you guys do. Uh, he has a fantastic sergeant. Um, he has a sergeant that used to play pro football. Now he's a cop. And Chris is a former Marine. He left that out. So he's always been involved in public service and taking care of the community and the United States. So Chris, I just wanted to pass out along. And I wanted the people that are on this uh, council attending this meeting to know uh, not everything you see in the news and, and not every every officer is needs discipline okay and i can say his team doesn't need it because they get firm leadership on a continuous basis thank, thank you. you jeff that is that's nice thank you so much for your time lieutenant patterson do you are there any other questions yes thank you for your service um any last comments questions concerns I'd just like to thank Lieutenant Patterson for showing up on short notice. And I'd also like to thank uh, Lieutenant Wheeler for setting this up. I contacted him on Monday. So excellent by APD to uh, hear the community's concerns and come on our workshop. Oh, my pleasure. And we'll be out there. Rest assured, we'll be out there. So you all have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. So next on the agenda, we have um, Lieutenant Jeff Albernathy. I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly, who is gonna um, do our Northwest crime report for um, Commander Saladin, who had um, a conflict. I think he was at the West Side Business. I don't know, he had a, another engagement. Um, so, Lieutenant Albernathy. Good evening, everybody, uh, as you guys just learned. My name is Lieutenant Jeff Abernathy. I'm the Northwest uh, Area Command Watch One Lieutenant, so I have the graveyard shift essentially uh, every night from 10 o'clock till 8 in the morning for your request if you have any. Um, and so this is my first time uh, doing the CPC for the Northwest, and it's the first time I've done CPC in quite a while. I was uh, uh, on an, in an inside position and then coming out to the field as the lieutenant out here. So um, Kind of currently, uh, the crime numbers for the past 30 days, uh, concluding with uh, May 18th, uh, so far in the past 30 days, uh, and I'm not sure how uh, necessarily Commander did this and how he reads it out to you guys, so I'll just give you the wrong numbers. So our auto burglaries, 35, residential burglaries, 10, uh, stolen vehicles, 38, Commercial vehicle or commercial burglaries, 18, robberies, seven, and then traffic stops through the 18th have been 358. And based on that number, that's roughly about 20 traffic stops a day. So it'll be about 605 by the uh, end of the month if everything stays as is. Um, over the, uh, since the beginning of the year or year to date, uh, traffic citations tend to fluctuate depending on a number of things going on, but uh, we're staying right around the mid 500s through about the 600 uh, citations per month. And that has uh, been pretty good. And my officers are out every night working traffic type plans that we have set up in the Northwest to try to address the traffic concerns. Obviously there's been a number addressed here tonight uh, and the DWI Lieutenant uh, Patterson just covered a number of those issues, but um, so far, year to date on uh, on our crimes, we're up in from March to April. We were up, and from in all categories, we were except for April in uh, residential burglaries, we were down. But we were pretty much working pr real hard in March with traffic stops, which uh, had a corresponding effect on crime and did bring down the numbers, you know, pretty significantly for auto burglary, residential burglary. Um, you know, and stolen vehicles. So obviously all the work that was done in March had a transitory effect into April, uh, which was great and uh, really improved the numbers. Not sure what the year to date will look 
all the way through to uh, the end of May. But if we continue on this trend, we are making an impact through uh, a PRT unit, which is out there uh, conducting a number of initiatives in the I in the Coors Corridor from I-40 to uh, Ellison and on the um, Hunter Corridor from I-40 all the way to uh, McMahon uh, to address traffic, you know, auto theft, cars traveling in and out of the area, those kinds of things right there. And those are having significant impact and continue to do so as this area, our current pot project is addressing those specific things to address uh, traffic and retail crime with the PRT unit. Um, I wish I had a graph, a good graph to show you. I have uh, Pete on there and I don't know. Pete, do you have the graph up by chance? Lieutenant, no, I do not have the graph up. Okay. Um, I can share that with you guys uh, through email if you'd like to see it. Uh, but the efforts so far have been uh, paying off dividends. And so, Pete, can you talk to anything specific to this uh, for all of you who I, I'm assuming may have met Pete in, the, Pete in the past? He's our crime analysis for the Northwest and does a superior job, has been with the Albuquerque Police Department for many years. And so, Pete, do you want to speak a little more to those specific numbers that are up that we have? Yes. Time? Yes, good evening, everyone. Yes, we look at the numbers the lieutenant was talking about, auto burglaries. Usually the trend we see now with the warmer weather, uh, our auto burglaries are going to go up. Uh, the burglars are out, it's warm, uh, they're out there late at night, they don't have to worry about the weather. So normally the trend with the auto burglaries and auto vehicle thefts, we do see an increase uh, on those uh, particular crimes. We do address them. Uh, we uh, like the neighbors, we like the associations to let us know particular if there's an increase. Uh, like I tell people, we, we have resources when it comes to bait cars, when it comes to field uh, briefings and so forth. But now with the summer, school's going to be uh, coming out probably in a couple of weeks. So we're going to see that increase. Uh, burglars know that families are going to go on vacation. Uh, you know, the kids are going to be with them. So what they're going to look for also is home burglaries. They're going to see if people are at home. So we emphasize to the homeowners, to the residents, uh, make sure you lock your doors. Uh, you know, let your neighbors know if you're going to be out of town. Uh, let the mailman know not to deliver uh, mail. Uh, just to keep an eye on the house. And if they see anything suspicious, definitely dial the 242 cops or the 911. I'm getting a lot of videos from the residents. And I wanna thank the Northwest Area Command residents that are under the public safety ring.com. Uh, and what they're doing is like uh, next door, uh, they actually send out alerts when it comes either they're being victims of an auto burglary or their camera witness an auto burglary, which was to a neighbor. And I get a lot of those. So I like to commend the neighbors for putting those alerts because every morning I look at the ring alerts and I give those to the officers because uh, we've got exceptional videos of the individuals and the vehicles so that the officers could go out there and address this concern. And they may realize I just stopped this person last week and we may be able to identify it. But thanks for the community to being involved in some of the public safety websites, the public safety ring alert, the next door, get a lot of information from that that we pass along to the neighbors also. Uh, Commander Sellen, and he apologized for not being here, but at this time as we speak, he's attending what is called the Westside Town Hall meeting that's comprised of the Southwest Area Command businesses, the Northwest Area Command businesses, uh, the mayor is going to be there, so I apologize for not being there. This morning, we had our coffee with the cop, so we missed some of you. Uh, we'll be having another coffee with the cop June 4th. That's going to be on a Saturday. The reason we pick Saturday, we figure a lot of people work, so Saturday, uh, they may be off, and it's going to be at the Donut Mart at 9 a.m., and I will be posting those flyers as we get closer. Uh, one of the other proactive business coalitions that we're going to be having this month and it's called the de-escalation training the west side business coalition which is comprised of the home depot off of i-40 and coors uh, walmart 
and some of the businesses along the strip mall, both on the east and west side. Commander has set up through our crisis intervention, a de-escalate training, and that's gonna be held May 31st, Tuesday from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. So a lot of the businesses have asked, what can we do if we have someone who has uh, some mental concerns, who's, uh, let's say, uh, disoriented, becoming disorderly? Uh, what can we do as a person, as an employee, uh, as a manager? So we're going to be having the de-escalation training for the employees. So we look forward. Uh, to giving that information to the employees. Any other businesses out there, uh, if you're interested, I've got my email and my phone number and having a de-escalate training in your business, please let me know. And uh, we could set up a date and a time for that program and that event. Wow, that's amazing, Pete. And I'm sorry I missed the um, donuts on... <laughs> Darn it. Uh, so actually, this is from Jeff, and he says, Pete, do you still have the House Watch program? Yes, we do. Now with uh, school getting out, summer here, uh, parents going on vacation, what you could do is you could dial the 768-4850. Uh, that is the phone number to the Northwest Area Command. And when the uh, receptionist answers, just let them know I'll be going on vacation for three days, for a week, a couple of days. And you like to put your house, what it's called, on a house check. So the beat officer will have that information. And what he will do, he will do a house check, realizing that these people are out of town. But yes, Jeff, we do have that. It's a great program. It works. I, yes. I can show you a video of a, a person on house watch and daily at least one officer went back i say daily it was actually in the night which is which is a good thing and you can yeah. see them shine their spotlight on there uh, that's old video that was two-year-old video but um it, it's a great program and and i'll go ahead and ask my other questions uh, uh lieutenant do, do you have any uh, of your thefts or vandalism um where are we standing on catalytic converters being stolen in our command or gas tanks theft um because i'm hearing that you know the the heck with you know you don't siphon gas no more now they drill a hole in the bottom of the tank and put the can there uh do you got any numbers on that that you could share sir or or, or pete you, whichever one wants the floor um you know from uh, we have not been given those reports and we haven't had a lot of those calls at night uh from uh, okay. the graveyard shift. And I haven't heard anything from other, from uh, Lieutenant Settler or uh, Lieutenant Petrick on the day in uh, swing shift and nor from PRT. I talked to them earlier about anything under the nutrients that they've had uh, or that they've heard about or learned about as they're out dealing with retail theft. And that hasn't been a big issue for sick, uh, particularly here. The, right. um, I know that there has been some reports in the media about uh, people uh, drilling tanks on diesel trucks to drain the fuel out and uh, capture that, but that is not something currently that uh, has become a big issue. Uh, appreciate appreciate the answer, sir. Just one other question. I don't have it in the chat. To, or is our census num number of officers officers assigned to the Northwest? And you may not know it. I mean, I know you know what's on your shift, but are we still hovering in up there around 55, 57? Uh, do you know offhand? Currently, that, that is correct. We're still about that same number. We do have right. a few classes that are getting ready to, uh, from a PSA standpoint, to join the ranks, you know, which is helping to supplement officers out there for those crimes which do not necessarily require an officer to be on so that we can uh, free up uh, yeah. officers for actual stuff. And then we have, of course, CNM and uh, the Albuquerque Police Department's own academy producing uh, upcoming graduating classes. So we're, we're headed in the right direction. The efforts of the department are pretty significant to recruit uh, good, solid talent from the local community and from other places to help with uh, obviously numbers and, and morale with having more officers out there to handle calls. So we're uh, reducing the, the severity of the workload that we're demanding at this point, just by virtue right. of the numbers. Right. And, and just for everybody's refresher, if you haven't heard it before, you know, uh, two years ago or so, we were down in a, in the high 30s of those numbers. And I think continuous uh, 
questions to the chain of command and plus I'm getting some more officers. We're now up to 55 to cover the whole Northwest, which is the largest geographical uh, substation and quadrant in the city because it runs from I-40 north to the city limits, the center of the uh, Rio Grande uh, west to the city limits. So it's a, it's a big quadrant and 55 to cover that 24 seven in Jeff's eyes, this Jeff's eyes and probably the other Lieutenant Jeff's eyes isn't enough, but we'll continue to push for more. And I appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Any other immediate questions before I kind of move on? Uh, oh, Jackie, go ahead, Jackie. Yes, um, they, our group may not be familiar with, um, I'm sorry if it's Settler or Suddler, I'm not sure, but I believe he's a new hire and he's there specifically to deal with this catalytic converter problem and be the liaison between the people who are buying cutoff um, catalytic converters and um, the people who are cutting them off um, to have a better track on that. So hats off to, uh, I guess the chief or whoever decided to have a whole, uh, somebody overseeing that program. Um, I think it's a good thing. I do see there's a question in there from uh, about the fingerprinting. I, just for everybody's information, in, in a, for burglaries or break-ins of any kind, if there is, we do call CSIs to come and document the damage, to document anything that may be of evidentiary value to the prosecution of the individual once they are uh, caught and apprehended and, uh, and then have to appear in court on, on whatever it is that uh, they have committed. So yes, we do still do that and we still continue to uh, collect that, that data and all the way down to just even, you know, as you're all aware of, even picking up casings that were shot out of some weapon somewhere to try to identify people. Hopefully that answers your question. Thank you, Janice. Um, Jackie, do you still, do you have another question or is um, your hand up from, oh, okay. Um, okay, are there, okay, Lieutenant Abernathy, are there any other questions for, with the crime report or any other comments, suggestions, thoughts? Jackie, are you currently in the in this Citizens Academy? Yes, and I love it. Okay. Uh, love there, our... could, could you share that with the rest of the people for those who have never went? I think it's an eye-opening experience. Um, you know, it I've been so long ago, I need probably need to go back through it someday. Uh, it is such an excellent experience. Uh, uh, one of the eye-opening things is, and maybe we won't be surprised at this, but every speaker who has taught us, and I believe we have those who also train the cadets, um, has been extremely professional and incredibly dedicated to what they do, and they love what they do, and they go out every day and want to make it better. Um, I think everyone would be comforted, encouraged, uh, enlightened, excited. It's a tremendous learning experience. Things you think you know about how our police department works are, there's a lot of incorrect information out there. And it'd be better for us as citizens to be passing on correct information and, and making our fellow citizens who are victims or potential victims or only see what the police department does from the news media. It, it's eye-opening, the attention to detail. And as I say, the professionalism is just off the chart over 10 plus, in my opinion. Um, it's very hands-on interactive. We've done role play with um, actors who teach the cadets how to deal with crisis intervention teams. Um, we're going to the gun range. We're going to handle some of the weapons. Um, you have the opportunity to be tased if you want to. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, it's an in-depth, it is an immersive, immersive experience. I highly recommend it. It does take a commitment. 
It's three hours a night, two nights a week, and some Saturdays. Um, but completely worth the experience. Oh, thank you, Jackie. That's good to know. I actually <clears throat> am interested in doing that. So that's good to know. Um, Tom. Application online. There's another case starting in uh, three or four months. I mean, really? another case. All right. That's good to know. Um, Tom, do you have a question? Hey. Pete, I just wanted to thank you for the uh, Block Watch Association meeting. You did a wonderful job. Yes. Uh, uh, you should uh, uh, tell people about this Block Watch Association. Thanks, Tommy. What the Block Watch Captain Association is, is every association who has a neighborhood watch, uh, once they have a neighborhood watch, that person or that, can, let's say that street, will elect a block captain. So what will happen with block captains is once a year, we have a yearly block captain meeting at the police academy. And during that meeting, it lasts uh, three to four hours. We have various speakers. We update uh, the block captains, what's going on uh, within the police department, what the trends are, what the patterns are. All the crime prevention specialists are there from all area commands and we introduce ourselves and we address any questions any concerns when it comes to block captains, but it's a good program. The block captains, we've had it now for a couple of years, and I've got over 107 block captains in the Northwest Area Command. I've got two neighborhood watch programs that I'll be starting this Saturday and next week, and both of those programs, they'll elect a block captain, uh, so they'll also be attending next year's meeting at the Academy. Okay, that's good. I, oh, Jackie. I went to that meeting as part of my homeowners association and the deputy chief spoke and his assistant, she was excellent. And he took every question that was thrown at him. He was very bold and very accepting of uh, criticism and offered, you know, what we're doing, what the department's doing to address the issues that were brought up. And he took some tough questions. So yeah. hats off to him, Pete. It was a really good meeting. Plus, what's nice about the block captains is this meeting, we want them to take that information back to their neighbors uh, so they could spread it around what they found out, uh, who the speakers are, and just update everyone on what's going on within the police department. Yeah. I've heard about your block captain um, program, Pete. I'm excited. Uh, Jeff. Yeah, um, I, I see there's a question in the chat down there. I'm gonna refer that to Lieutenant Abernathy if he's still on, because I mean, I know they have 55, but to answer how they have them spread out, how many are actually out on the street those days, there's a lot of variables, but you know, uh, Jeff Abernathy, if, you, if you'd address that, I'd appreciate it, sir. Yes, sir. The answer to the question simply is we do have the 55 patrol officers assigned to the Northwest. Uh, I think the total right. command strength is somewhere around 70, including uh, detectives and uh, command staff, such as myself and other lieutenants and sergeants. So, <clears throat> so we do have about 55 officers out there uh, on patrol uh, every day, you know, minus those that are off for uh, you know, whether they're sick or they're training or whatever the case may be. So we do have, uh, we obviously we want more numbers. Uh, just as you had mentioned earlier, this is a large area command with a lot of physical territory to cover. And so it does require a lot of planning, looking at the information that Pete produces for the area command, which hats off to him. He does a great job and he's a, an outstanding individual and has a lot of information that we could use to better direct and guide the, our patrol efforts to come into sync with the other efforts of not only PRT, uh, the, what uh, the crime analysis are saying and how they're giving us information and feedback, but also for our impact units and their ability to go out and to capture and bring to prosecution or to bring to justice those that are out committing a lot of these uh, crimes that we see throughout the city. And, and as Pete had said earlier, as we get into the warmer months, it's not unusual to see the numbers start to climb, uh, especially as kids get out of school and there's you know, a lot of heat and a lot of boredom that goes on. And I'd like to give a hats off to the community, uh, not, not only block captains, but to the uh, community groups for calling. I don't get a lot of direct phone calls from the community, just 
uh, coming in at night, but I get them, uh, they ca they'll call the commander, they'll call the uh, area command and pass along, uh, especially as it comes to uh, traffic stuff uh, out in the uh, neighborhoods uh, out there by the Nusenda Credit Union. I think that's the inspiration uh, neighborhood out there and out in um, the neighborhoods out there by uh, to the west and uh, south of uh, CNM reference drag racing in a neighborhood. We are coming up with a plan to kind of deal with that too. Oh, well, not to kind of, we're coming up with a plan to deal with that, but it's a much more broad perspective since the county line is up behind the school there. And we've had a number of complaints from citizens about drag racing on Rainbow between uh, Irving and Paseo del Norte. So for anybody who may be here from those neighborhoods, we have officers go out there every night. We have them running patrols, looking for stop sign violations, looking for drag racing, speeding, all those things. And we have produced some pretty good numbers out of there, uh, as well as we've had a number of complaints reference shots fired uh, off in the desert to the west. And so we are working with not only our air support unit, open space, uh, we will be getting, uh, my sergeants are getting with the traffic unit, both DWI and motors to set that up so that we can kind of, so we can go out and push those individuals out of those party areas and address that kind of behavior going on in the neighborhoods because that's going to make lean to an increase of other kind of crimes with people being intoxicated or on various kinds of whatever so we're also trying to work with the Sandoval County Sheriff's Department to help us with this because the line is right there and if they jump off into the other side of the county line we want to make sure that we have a way to make the point that this is not the place they want to come to this kind of behavior and to bring a little bit of peace and quiet for the summer hopefully out that way to those neighborhoods. Thank you. Um, let me ask, uh, Jeff, do you have another question or is your hand still up? Uh, I, I don't think you put it down, but uh, oh, I think uh, the Lieutenant answered the question there. And, uh, you know, uh, I want to go back to the block captain. Um, and, and we expressed this at the block captain's meeting, but uh, block captains used to have a somewhat of a point of contact of an officer out of their command and where we could uh, email or communicate with them some things that we were seeing. And uh, a restructure uh, last year took the block captain out of touch with an officer in the command. And at the block captain's meeting, we brought this up. I don't know if that ever made the minutes good enough, but they moved the officer and the officer now contacts the neighborhood association um the neighborhood association is isn't as in tune with uh the police department like the block captains are we wanted it brought back to the block captains uh pete do you know did that get addressed are they re-evaluating it or is it or did someone bang the gavel and said no we're going to keep it the way it is as far as I know, Jeff, uh, the block captain, the officers are responsible for that block captain, vice versa. Uh, as far as I know, it's never been given the responsibility of that neighborhood association. Uh, what I have found out, because officers will either transfer to other area commands, uh, they may be promoted to detectives, uh, what I tell all my block captains, if you have not heard from your officer within that month, let me know, because I will see if that officer has been transferred, has been promoted. And if I find that, I will give them a new officer and I will give that information to the new officer to notify and introduce themselves to the block captain. But as far as I know, uh, that responsibility uh, has not been given to the neighborhood association. It's the responsibility of the block captain and the officer assigned and vice versa. Okay, I need a new one. I haven't heard from one in over eight months. Yeah. Okay. I so, haven't heard from one in two and a half years. Yeah. It's important uh, and thank you for addressing that. Please, yep. Karen and anyone else out there, if you have not heard it, please let me know. Because a lot of times, once these officers go to another area command, uh, they don't notify their block captain. Uh, so that's where my contact comes in. Uh, Karen, I will look it up. And uh, I, that officer has been reassigned. I will make sure that you get a new officer. 
And don't forget me, Pete. Come on. Share Same the love. <laughs> also for you, Jeff. Yes. <laughs> Is there anybody else on there that's block captains that has not heard from a from a uh, officer? Now, this officer isn't assigned to you as a as an assistant that you run to them. It 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 doesn't take away from calling nine one one or two four two cops. It, it's for little things. Hey, you know, I'm noticing this in my neighborhood uh, mailbox vandalism. Uh, all the mailboxes were open. Um, you know, someone threw eggs up against the house. Things of that nature. So it gives them a feel for what do you want to call it? Um, uh, they're, they're they're very petty misdemeanor crimes to a point. But it's a nuisance crimes, as I call them. And, and then, uh, you know, you, if you can pinpoint the time of when you knew it happened, you pass that on. It does not substitute from, nor does it make that block captain your main person. Okay, but it, just, just let anybody know, if you're thinking of starting a, a neighborhood watch program, I highly encouraged it. I did one several years ago. Pete helped me set it up. I have 43 houses on my block. 40 of them joined. We had some crime going on. And within a month after doing the neighborhood watch, the people decided they didn't want to mess around in this neighborhood anymore. So uh, it works. And I know Tom knows it works too. Um, so I, I appreciate it. Yes. Aaron, I'm, I'm done. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Tom and Karen. And thank you, Pete, for looking into all of these block captain. Um, usually, what, usually what we find out every year, the officers have what it's called a bid. And it goes by seniority. And these officers will bid to different area commands, different uh, locations, day shift, swing shift, graveyard, even may get, get promoted. So I've seen every year we lose 20 to 25 percent of our officers. So those 20, 25 percent officers who are assigned block captains, now I have to give those block captains new officers. So every year, whenever we have a bid and that, uh, you know, we encounter that, uh, we see that. We see 20, 25 percent officers are no longer working the Northwest Area Command, but we get new officers to replace them. And those officers will be assigned block captains. And just so everyone, for everybody's information, there is some effort by the department uh, underway, and I'm not prepared to talk about details about it, to try to incentivize officers to stay within their area commands for a longer period of time. Uh, and this goes directly to addressing these kind of issues here yep. so that when you do get a block captain or you do get officers in your sector or your beat and you get to know these officers to try to keep them there to build those relationships with the community through the long-term uh, officer so that obviously that oh, that door of communication is much broader and allows it for a lot better information flow so that we can more effectively address concerns right in the right at the neighborhood level all the way out through the community level and i and i'm and i'm proud the department has decided to go that route because i think it will make a massive impact not only for our ability to serve the community in a much more effective way but also going all the way back to talking about compliance and helping officers to really get a relationship built with their community that's a very true statement that's a very true statement keep kelly mays on the northwest he's an excellent officer for you uh pete steve <laughs> Steve says he hasn't heard from his block captain since March the 7th. Okay. For those All of right. you that have mentioned that you have not heard your block captain, if you could please email me tomorrow morning, I will pull up the block captain's list and see if those officers have left the Northwest Area Command, and I will assign you new officers. But if you can please email me, and I will address that tomorrow morning and assign new officers. Thanks, Pete. You're welcome. Okay, um, any uh, Lieutenant Abernathy, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Uh, we're Good just morning. running a little over time and everything's fine. This is so informational and important and necessary. Uh, but is there anything else you wanna add? I just wanted to add since uh, I'm, uh, I'm awake while most everybody is asleep. If you do need to get into contact with me, feel free to reach out to Pete and he can pass along my contact information to anybody uh, that needs or, you know, especially at night if something's going on, I'm, I'm available. I'm out there with my folks uh, out there making sure that uh, we're out trying to meet those needs. And if there's for some reason you don't believe that we're, we're where we should be, 
I'm always willing to listen and try to see what we can do to better meet those needs. So uh, like I said, uh, Pete's a good resource. So feel free to reach him if you need to get to contact with me directly. Thank you, Lieutenant. Uh, and Pete, any last comments or questions or suggestions? Uh, just remember, you know, with the summer coming, school's going to be out uh, with the warm weather. Uh, the numbers kind of uh, mentioned an increase in auto burglars. Uh, just be aware of it uh, at your house, uh, at your shopping, at restaurants, uh, even going to the gym. Uh, during the summer, we do see that up increase in activity when it comes to auto burglaries, stolen vehicles. Uh, Jeff mentioned the, the catalytic converters. You know, be aware of that. I talked to some neighbors. I talked to one neighbor this morning at the coffee with the cop and he's going to go to uh, one of the auto dealerships or mechanics to actually put a lock or some sort of a lock system over yeah. his catalytic converter so that yeah. they won't steal his catalytic converter so you know be aware of that now with the warm weather coming up and the summer here thanks pete so uh you had another question there Morris. It, oh, can we okay. post Can about I... these programs on next door and ring um i know apd is not allowed to go in there or at least they weren't they weren't allowed to go in there i don't think that rules changed but that's correct jeff and if we're not uh, the next door the way it was set up we will receive any information that they sent to me via next door uh but then also the link when it comes to the public safety ring.com uh, just like a next door what you do it's free uh, you register and then once you're in you could actually look at the, all the areas within the northwest area command look at the videos and you could also send alerts but i get those every morning from neighbors that have been victims or they observed some sort of criminal activity oh and you know what this message is from steven and he says my APD assigned to me is doing well. We have just not had anything ongoing here to report to him, but Steve is, Steven is happy with his APD personnel. So that is good to hear. Okay, so any final comments? No, thank you, Pete. Thank you, Lieutenant You're welcome. Albert thank you, thank you all. So now we are going to move on to active participation. So if you have a question or comment um, from the attendees, go ahead and raise your hand and we will uh, promote you or allow you to speak, I should say. So. In the meantime, we can probably start talking about next month's topic and also about uh, hybrid meetings. We were thinking about doing it this month, but we haven't really been able to get everyone on board. So let's let the uh, attendees speak if they feel like it's something they might be interested in and what sort of topics they might be interested in. Looks okay. like Lynn Martin wants to Yes, come. I'm gonna allow her to speak. Lynn? All right. You're muted. You got the mute on, Lynn. Okay. Kelly, can you take her off mute? I can you do it for her? Oh, here we go. Lynn? Uh, Lynn, you were just unmuted. I, I can just ask her to unmute. I, I did that too, Kelly. Okay. There we Thank go. you. I just wanted to let everybody know that the Albuquerque uh -oh. Log Captains Association holds two meetings a year, one in the fall and one in the spring. So there'll be another meeting coming up the end of September, 1st of October. All right. That time frame. Excellent. I attended the last and one. It was some good information and uh, you and it's definitely correct. The police answered, answered some very tough questions and did a great job. Very good. Okay. Thank you, Lynn. Okay, so what are we thinking for next month? Jackie? 
I would love for us to hear from Angel Garcia and his uh, LOE partner on the violence intervention program. They're having really wonderful success. Um, and it's a very unique partnership that's been formed. Um, and I understand that the mayor even goes on some of the um, interviews or meetings with the clients that they work with. It's, um, I think it's a really important and the city ought to have more support behind it. Okay. Angel did come to this panel. Kelly, you probably can correct me. Angel was on this panel about three months ago. Yeah. Uh, I'm not opposed to him coming back. Uh, you know, maybe someone new will be on that will hear him. Um, you know, if, I, if that's what the rest of the panel wants. I mean, I, I hear what you're saying because you probably just came in contact him, with him down at the academy. Um, yeah. Um, I, I, I do recall him being here not too long ago. I'm going to say I'm it was about three months. Sorry, yeah. I missed yeah. that. But it's, yeah. it's pretty amazing what they're doing. Yeah. Uh, we also have the Rapid Ability Diversion Program, the RAD program, which is another one in Albuquerque that does the same thing. They generally work with uh, with kids who make minor issues and they try to get the, um, the offender and the person who is offended together to have a conversation. So that's another person we can have on who's sort of in this crime prevention vein, if, if anyone is interested. Uh, what do you all think out there in the attendee room? What would you like to see the Northwest, Northwest Policing Council cover? I'm here, but my camera, you guys all keep freezing on me, so I'm going to keep my camera off. Okay. Okay. So, uh, any other questions on what someone would like to see next month? Karen. Yeah, we talked a little bit at the planning meeting about perhaps getting some different people in to talk to us about homelessness and how we're trying to pull all the different efforts together between nonprofits and the city and the county. Um, <coughs> we might be able to do that, Kelly, as a panel. Mm -hmm. with a few different organizations speaking together. Okay. And I, I will reach out to someone from Family Promise um, okay. right now and see if we can get her to come as part of that if you want to do it. Does anyone want to have uh, uh, ideas on a thought panel, uh, homelessness panel? I Kelly. Kelly, not, not on that, but have you gotten any speakers at other CPCs that were interested or interesting and maybe we could invite them? Yeah, we got, oh, we've, we've uh, run the whole gamut of speakers. We have different, obviously, ideas in every, um, in every uh, meeting, in every council. So if we can just have some sort of a basic idea, we could always uh, reach out to people and get an interesting topic going. Yeah, so. Okay, uh, Mike Krachowski, that's the uh, chair of the Southeast. We're gonna promote you here, Mike. Since it was your idea to promote people in the first place. Mike? That's, that's Charles Bronson's nephew, so we all know. Okay, should we move on to Tara while we wait for Mike to connect? Uh, Mike's got his speaker off. <clears throat> can you hear me? Yeah, Tara. Yeah, Tara, we can hear you. Okay, um, I was wondering how can we like go out there and tell people about DPC and like the neighborhood watches and the block cop captains and all that. 
Um, and like, what if the neighborhoods have like a block party and we can give out information? Promotion, to, that's always yeah. one of our issues. Yes, we're trying to get the word out there. Who has ideas on that? One of the things I will be discussing on Friday at the uh, chair's meeting is that I would like to get some interns from the city to help with social media. I think that would be a good move uh, to sort of, um, I should be a sub subject, um, subject matter expert at this point, but I don't know. I don't think social media is my thing. So, you know, we're gonna try to get a little help with that. What, what would you think, Tara? Um. Well, like, like neighborhoods, if, well, social media, of course, um, maybe like doing, maybe calling the news so people can see that these are available. And I think like the more people that have more community watches and know about CPC and um, all these different things that the city offers, um, well, it would help prevent crime for sure. That's and so, because then they don't, people won't want to come to our neighborhoods and do things if they know that everybody's watching. Right. Yes. So We're going to do better at getting the word out there. But social media for sure. Okay. Mike? Uh, first of all, can you hear me all right? Um, it, it, um, the Southwest CPC had a three-part series on uh, homelessness. Uh, I think it was December, January, February. Um, I don't remember what year it was, but uh, we uh, uh, had contacted through one of our uh, committees uh, on collaboration and partnerships we reached out to the New Mexico Coalition and Homelessness. I try to attend some of their uh, regular meetings uh, by Zoom and um, helped out in a couple of other things. And if you want to talk about that, um, I, I'm sure that they would be thrilled to, uh, to join one of your, your meetings. So all you have to do is just get in touch with me and I'll get you uh, hooked up with them, okay? Okay. Thank you, Mike. So who would like to do a panel next month uh, specializing on homelessness? I would. Sounds like a good idea, basically. Okay. Yeah. Yep. I would. All right. We'll think about <laughs> and it. And I'll people. ask, I can ask um, Family Promise Director to come if you like as okay. one of the... That's great. She, she's right around the corner from me. I haven't Karen? talked to her for months, but uh, it, it, uh, I'm sure that she would be happy to be. She, she was in a recent meeting. There's some, uh, I promoted this uh, a little bit on the Southeast. There is something called the Albuquerque Strategic Collaborative and they meet uh, monthly and I can send you information about that. Um, I'll send it um well, I've got your emails, <laughs> but I'll send that to all of you. And uh, um, Kevin, Ar Arthur, I, I, I'll lose track of names, but I, I'll get you in touch with them. And okay. Um, <clears throat> okay, so we will put that on the uh, docket for June. So, in July, we have a uh, we have a uh, nomination to bring Angel from VIP on because I think it was was it December or January he was on last time, so I'll have to double check that. But uh, and let's think of a secondary topic for July. Yeah. And uh, can we, Kelly? I, do we need to think about July like right now? No, not right now. I'm just saying, okay. keep, it in your, keep it in your minds in the meantime. Karen? I think that um, presentation on that was at the Northeast last time on courts would okay. be fabulous. On bail enforcement? Yeah, bail enforcement. I mm -hmm. think that would be great. Okay, okay. That guy was really interesting and he's eager to talk to 
more yeah. areas within the city. That's yeah. one for you too, Mike. Great information, yeah. Okay, uh, so I will put that down as a possibility for July. And what else? So we've got the first hybrid meeting tomorrow night with Mike's uh, Southeast Council. Uh, what are we thinking about here? We don't have to, we can do it later. We can do it every three months. You know, it, it's strictly up to the members of the council. And to, it, we have eight attendees left. What do you think about going back to, uh, is it a possibility you would show up to an in-person meeting or are you, are you perfectly fine doing what you're doing now? I'm good with in-person. I'm good with in-person too, this is Tara. Okay. I like in-person. All okay. right, it sounds like in-person. I mean, I'm on the fence, but if it if majority wants in-person, then we can do one and see how it works. I will have okay. some, some meetings when I won't be able to attend yeah. or in person only, just okay. because of medical treatments. Understood. But most of them I'll be able to. And I'm yeah, okay. and we will. We I will be option. masked. <laughs> we will I'll have the option of doing a hybrid as well. I mean, you know, if, if you cannot make it, that's fine. Yeah, I could do a hybrid if I can't. Yeah. Be in person. I mean, I'd like to see more than half the council members show up in person, but you know, that's, yeah. that's up to the council. So does anybody in the attendee room have a, uh, have a, have a opinion on this? Will you come if we have an in-person meeting? It would be terrible if it was just us and an APD. Okay, Janice Siazzi says, I prefer Zoom. Stephen Leffler says, I'll be there. Okay, that's fine. If we can get six, seven people, that's all we need. So, all right. All right, Marcella, back to you. Okay. Yep. This All right, well, if there are no other comments, questions, concerns, then let's adjourn and we will be in person in June. Jack, Jack Lyons asks, where are the meetings? It's oh. the, Jack, uh, what do they call that center again? Is it Don the Newton Red? Community Center? Don, oh, Don, Don Newton, Newton, that's right. Don Newton. Yeah. Don Newton Taylor Ranch. That's right. Okay. Don Newton Community Center. And if you can make it, that's great. And if not, please sign on online and hopefully we can keep bringing great content. Kelly, you can set that up. Yes. Yeah, we were all set up to go this month, but I was not sure exactly who was uh, interested in it. So if, if, as far as I'm concerned, we're set for June. So before we adjourn, how does it work? <laughs> the in-person meeting? No, if we did a hybrid. Oh, oh the, the hybrid meeting, I have a camera. We ordered an expensive camera that has 360 degree views. So we, we, set up, we, we set up around the table, the camera moves and pans and uh, it, it, it catches everybody's audio pretty well. We haven't done a lot of tests so far. Our first real test is tomorrow night. And we'll have people at the in the audience facing the tables, so it'll be just like the old days, which is before nice. I was. Nice, <laughs> very nice. All right. Okay, thank All you. Right. Thank Bye. you. Bye, guys. Bye. Good night, everybody. Bye. Night. Enjoy this weather. Yes. Well, on Saturday. Alrighty. Bye. Bye.